Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a really kind of cool new recording, I really like this, um, of Florent Schmidt, the ballet La Tragédie de Salome, Ooh, ha, 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 ha. and the Chant Elegiac. Well, the Chant Elegiac is a short little piece that's really lovely and elegiac, as you might expect. It's elegiac. It has a lovely melancholy quality. It's written for large orchestras, everything Schmidt wrote was, just about. And um, it's, it's fun to listen to and it hasn't been played a lot, so here we go. Now, the tragedy of Salome exists in two versions. Version number one is the one that we all know and love as best represented by Jean Martinon's iconic recording. It's a big 25, 26 minute long symphonic poem. The original version is sort of like a ballet thing, a ballet pantomime-ish thing, and that's what we get here. It's written, I believe, for a slightly smaller orchestra. It was recorded once before um, on Marco Polo quite well, too. So it's not entirely a premiere, um, but it's a bit longer. It dates from 1907. It has 22 short numbers, whereas the uh, final version it cuts out a bunch of them and knits it together rather nicely into a a more continuous um, structure. And I have to confess, I like the revised shorter tone poem version better, simply because it's less fragmentary and it also is more lavishly scored, believe it or not, especially the very ending. The dance of terror. The dance of terror is full of total cataclysm. I mean, it ends with like, you know, the apocalypse and Tam Tam's crashing and stuff. And oh, it's just marvelous. The, the story of the ballet, just so that you get a sense of it, is not the same thing as the biblical Salome in the sense that, you know, she gets the head and Herod has her killed or whatever it is. It's, it's, it's a little weirder than that. It's because it's, there's dancing. So they have to have an excuse. You know, you have three basic portraits of Salome. Salome is a coquettish young girl in the Dance of the Pearls. And then she's a more voluptuous thing, and then she's the evil, malevolent, give me the head of John the Baptist critter. And in this particular telling of the story, um, there's, there's a mystical aspect, that is the Dead Sea is sort of right there, and you can see goodies of the Dead Sea, like your future and whatnot, and Herod and his people are all very, you know, worried about the future, and when she gets the head of John the Baptist, she flings it into the ocean, whereupon it comes back, of course it comes back, it's multiplied millions of times, giant heads everywhere, and or one big jumbo head, like uh, one of those, you know, Macy's parade floats, or helium-filled balloon, or, I don't know. Anyway, the head comes back and sort of goes after her, and she's terrified, and, and, and everything is bathed in blood, and oh, it's just fun. It's really fun. I mean, however you slice it, however you want to take it, it's an awfully enjoyable listen. I'm exotic and voluptuous and all that stuff. So uh, this performance has the Frankfurt Radio Symphony under Alain Altinoglu, um, who's done some very nice, I mean, did that nice Franck disc and whatnot. I mean, he's quite good. And he's doing some interesting French repertoire, so it would seem, for the Alpha Classics label. He's extremely well recorded. And I got to say, uh, you know, there's a soprano solo, by the way, and in the, in the Salome thing, you know, that sings an authentic, you know, Middle Eastern, Asian sort of tune thing. I'm nicely sung here by Amber Braid. And I, I enjoy this. I enjoy this just quite well, quite, quite a lot. I mean, it's fun. The music is just fun. It, it, it's not uh, the kind of thing that you need to, to worry about, you know, taking seriously. In other words, it's lavish and lush and physical and and at the end of it, you know, it was considered kind of radical in 1907. And, and Schmidt dedicated the tone poem one, anyway, the revision to Stravinsky, who was just about to write The Rite of Spring. And Stravinsky said that he liked it. I mean, later in his career, after he turned neoclassical, he probably didn't like it so much. But at the time, uh, when people were looking for big, gigantic orchestral extravaganzas and were being encouraged to write similarly, um, this was one 
It was definitely one of them, and it's certainly worth hearing. So if you know the tone poem, if you know that great Jean Martinon recording or some of the other ones that came out since, you know, there was a Paul Paré one and some other people did it, um, you definitely should give this one a listen because it's not the same. And so, I mean, the music is similar in most places, a lot of the same music, but it's scored differently. And there's music in here that you won't hear in the tone poem. And so it's worth adding to your collection and making the comparisons. I mean, that's so much fun to make those comparisons. But of course, you have to listen enough times so that you know what you're comparing. Um, and, and the music is good enough that it withstands that sort of thing. It really does. I mean, it's, it's, it's just a really good time. And I had a really good time listening to this, and so will you. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care. <laughs>